Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listoffrederick.com, but we are joined by a family member of this podcast, funny man himself, Mr. Michael Phillips of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. How are you doing on this hot and beautiful Monday here in the DMV, Michael? I love it. I heard there weren't enough Michaels on this podcast. I need to make sure to improve that situation. Last night was the nicest night of the year because it was both pleasant and the bugs aren't out yet. That, yes. That's a win-win for me. Valid point. Valid yeah. point. And, <laughs> and speaking of the weather, Michael, I've been wanting to get you on here to get your uh, two cents because you came out with, I think it was about two weeks ago on the Richmond Times-Dispatch, a column about the new stadium and how the Washington Brass would want a climate-controlled type of stadium, which means a roof over top. Is that correct? Yeah, there's, there's going to be a roof on this new stadium, wherever it is. That's definitely part of Jason Wright's planning process. It, it, it's it's a big mental leap for everybody because, you know, if football in the Northeast isn't played with roofs. Uh, you know, you look around, Baltimore doesn't have one, Pittsburgh doesn't have one, Carolina doesn't have one on up, New York, New England, Buffalo. Uh, it's, it's part of football is out in the elements, but uh, – uh, definitely, uh, we've seen a lot of new stadiums with the roof in recent years, Atlanta, Minnesota, um, you know, Dallas obviously has the retractable and, and that's going to be part of the play here. Yeah. Right. And it, you, you seem to be a stadium expert. So as you know, about a week ago, Twitter was in an uproar because of the three locations in Virginia that were named as possible site destinations. Which one of those do you think is the most likely to happen and should Maryland fans be concerned? Well, <laughs> So, so we've got the three sites in Virginia. We've got the, the Loudon site and then the two in Prince William, Woodbridge right. and Dumfries. And then, and then you've got RFK absolutely still in play. You know, I, nice. people sound surprised when I say that. They're working hard. They want it. I, I don't think they're going to get it uh, for, for a lot of reasons that I, I don't think are entirely their fault. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a tough piece of land to get. It's controlled by a lot of different people with a lot of different stakes. Uh, you know, they're still working very hard to try to make it happen. I don't think it will ultimately, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not trying. Kind of like this quarterback search, you know, they're, they're out there. They're, they're trying. Uh, they're trying as hard as they can. And then, then the final site, the fifth site, the FedEx site in Landover. So Maryland has ruled out uh, the National Harbor site. It, it's FedEx or nothing in Maryland. They're down to that one what? site. Wow. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I know I know people were jacked up about that National Harbor site. So I, I think that definitely changes the calculus for how excited people are about Maryland, knowing yeah. it's going to be at the Landover site, not the National Harbor site. Um, right. I think at the end of the day, everybody wants RFK. We'll put that aside. It, it comes down to money. And Maryland's got about $200 million on the table right now, which is not nothing. Uh, but Virginia's putting a billion dollars on the table, and that's five <laughs> times more. And, and I think at the end of the day, if you're choosing between suburban sites, they're going to take the eight hundred million dollars. Come on now, like yeah, I, I right. mean, and, and I don't blame them either because I yeah. would do it too. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so I, I consider Virginia far and away the front runner at the moment. That's not to say Maryland won't come back to the table with more, but I, I haven't seen an indication that they're super interested in doing that. Now, break down the Maryland sites for you. Everybody wants loud of the Maryland sites. It makes a lot of sense. It's on the Metro. Uh, it's, it's a place that's very densely populated already, uh, both with a lot of people and a lot of corporations. It's very accessible in a weird, like if traffic didn't exist sort of way to Bethesda, <laughs> to Montgomery County, the, the parts of DC that, you know, are, are still loyal to the team. I, I think it's a strong site. Woodbridge feels implausible for a lot of reasons. There's not as much land as you'd think there. Uh, that'd be a tough one to pull off. Dumfries, man. Nobody likes Dumfries, all right? No. So we'll just put that out there out of the gate. I don't even think the people in Dumfries like Dumfries. Um, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out in the sense of there's a lot of land in Dumfries, mostly because people don't want to live in Dumfries, I guess. But it's, I hope nobody in Dumfries listens to this podcast. Is it, you know, I don't, I don't they mean agree to be with you. On, yeah. I don't mean to be dunking on your city, but I they, they know they're not in the lot. You yeah. can't um, spell Dumfries without dump, Michael. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> and fries. fries as well. Yeah. Fries. Um, there's a lot of land there. And, and so, you know, if they're talking about 
big sprawling amphitheaters and hotels and retail and all this development they want to do. It is a very logical place to put it in the sense that you could obtain a lot of land there and develop it. I find it illogical in almost every other way. I think that I really think the fans would be okay with the Loudon side. I know there's a lot of grumbling about the Loudon side. I think people would come around on it. I think it's more accessible than people give it credit for. I think people would deal with the FedEx side. I don't think it's perfect, but I, I think people would deal with it. I think the Dumfries side is the one of the bunch, though, where people would just say, no, they did not yeah. get this right. I'm not taking it off the table, but I, I think that understanding will come into clear focus. So basically, real fast, what you're saying is if Dumfries gets its criminal charges dropped and still has the civil charges, they're still in play. <laughs> He's not commenting on that. No. <laughs> That's great. We'll deal with the suspension. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, if Dumfries happens, I feel like it would it would be a real tough moment for a lot of fans, particularly the fans who, who you know, just rely on Metro or rely on easy access. Like, I, I don't know. I, it, it, I think the, the FedEx site, one of the things they're pitching there is bringing the stadium closer to the Metro, which I think makes a whole lot of sense. Um, just in terms of, you know, you want to host big events there. You want to do things like that. Um, so I, I think you've got three Metro accessible sites, Loudon, RFK, and, and you know, the, the Landover site. And then you've got Dumfries. It, it's there. It's just hanging out. Right, right. Well, since Reed brought up the uh, the quarterback position what? in a, a little slightly, <laughs> um, over the weekend, obviously the news broke. Ian Rappaport came out with the news that the commanders offered the Seahawks – a in their eyes i guess in some people's eyes a sizable trade offer and obviously seattle turned it down um my question is do you think that russell wilson is still on the table and if if not where do they go from here i've always maintained the seahawks would be crazy to deal him so look at the circumstance there you got you got pete carroll he's old uh, like you know nothing personal against him but you know he's are you really going to task him with the rebuild when you blow the thing up? Are you going to bring in a new coach? That's right. You know, are you, are you going to commit to five to six more years of Pete Carroll? Are you going to run this out? And then number two, the division NFC West rocked last year. It was a really good division. And so I think you can excuse some of the results in that context in the context of Russell Wilson getting hurt, but look at what's happened since it looks like the Rams are going to kind of implode here with all their success. Some folks retiring, you know, salary cap coming due for them. Kyler Murray's doing sending out all caps, tweets from Arizona, whatever he's doing, um, you know, and, and then, you know, you, you got, who am I missing here? Oh, the 49ers. Hey, you know, you got these whispers, oh, is Trey Lance ready or not? Well, that, that's not an encouraging sign for anybody. You know, if, if your number three overall quarterback is people are asking if he's ready or not. So I, I don't know. I, if I were Seattle, I would absolutely take another shot at this thing. You don't have a bad team. You got a great quarterback. Um, if he's traded, I don't doubt that Washington's very much in the mix law for, a great package could potentially get the job done. I think Russell Wilson, like me in here, everything lines up logically. But, man, I just can't get over that hurdle where why in the world would Seattle trade him? I still don't see it. Yeah, I think I agree with you there. And it, Speaking of retaining talent here, Michael, uh, Ben Standig, your colleague from The Athletic, made a tweet uh, today talking about a possible meeting that J.D. McKissick had. And then also he had another tweet saying that Landon Collins and the Washington Commanders are possibly looking to restructure his deal to keep him on the team for 2022. So what are you hearing? Yeah, we would start with J.D. McKissick. Ron loves J.D. McKissick. They're like soul brothers or something, man. You know, they've got a thing. And I, and I think that's part of why J.D. McKissick hasn't been re-signed. It, Ron knows his role will always be what it is here. Like, you know, he's never going to be the featured back here for a lot of reasons. And I, I think his message to J.D. is, hey, if you want to go kick the tires in free agency, see if a team will give you a big deal, I don't want to hold you back from that. Like, you should go do that. If you're going to play for the veteran minimum, and come be a third down back somewhere. I think you should do it here, and I think he will do it here ultimately. Um, you know, they, the, the running back market is always a weird one. Yeah. Uh, I don't begrudge him wanting to go out and see what's out there for him. I don't think I don't think anything's going to be out there for him. I think it'll get done ultimately. He'll come back. Uh, you know, I, after taking a lap around the block, Landon's a way more interesting thing because look, you can't have Landon Collins on the team for sixteen million dollars. You just can't do it. Everybody sees that, but. He showed some stuff, and you know, he, he's people talk very positively about his off the field involvement with the rookies. Um, he could have made that a very uncomfortable room last year, and he didn't. 
you know, you go talk to Cam Curl, Cam Curl likes him, uh, you know, and that, that's not the case everywhere where a young guy takes an older guy's role. Um, so they think very highly of him. Uh, they, they would like to have him back, but is, is his pride going to get in the way of that? Is another team going to get in the way of that? I, I, I don't know. I think Landon Collins still has some good football ahead of him. If another team wants to pay him to do that, more power to them. The question is, if there's not a Landon Collins market, is he willing to swallow his pride, come back, take the pay cut it's going to take to get this done? Uh, that's a tough question. Only he can answer that. Um, but it sounds like the talks have been pleasant so far. We'll see where it goes in the next few weeks. I, it wouldn't stun me if he's back. But, man, it, it's a big ask of anybody. Hey, come back, and we're going to pay you half as much money. Right. Yeah. So, so sticking with the free agents, this will, this will be kind of a two-parter. So out of our free agents, who do you think is the first to get re-signed? I mean, if that's who J.D. McKissick, Bobby McCain, uh, Brandon Sheriff, if people think he's going to stay. Um, so. and, yeah. And have you heard of any possible free agents that Washington could be interested in? Yeah, I'm writing off Sheriff and Settle. I think yeah. they're both out yeah. just in terms of pay. I wouldn't rule out them grabbing another wide receiver. I'm going to tell you the name. I'm not hearing it is Amari Cooper. I know people understand why why the dots would be connected there. But I do think Washington will be very aggressive in the wide receiver market because you watch these teams that are succeeding, you need two dynamic weapons. Right. Now, let's get to the hard truth of the matter here, which is Curtis Samuel did not play this year. And you know what? What's he going to give you in the future? I, I don't know that you could, if you're talking about big lead forward and, you know, playoff season, I, I think you might need to bring in another receiver. And that's tough because of how much money you gave him. Uh, first design, I'm going to take Terry McLaurin. I know not a true free agent, but I, I think there's Love tremendous that. desire yeah. on this team's part to get a deal done. Wouldn't blame him if he wants to sit this out and wait for the quarterback situation to resolve. I would totally understand that from his end, but I, I think the team, has communicated that their desire to get something done lock him down long term. Uh, I think the kiss will happen when it happens. I think the cane will happen when it happens. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot of day one high urgency guys here for this team to chase, but I would say those are my two. I'm looking at kind of a wide receiver and, and then tearing the floor. And if he's open to it, getting it done and staying here. Right. Yeah, they, uh, they definitely got to get Terry locked in for the next couple of years. Um, they, they know that too. And, and Hey, Terry knows that too. <laughs> That's good <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So there seems to be two different sides of how people view this team. There's a side of the people that view this as, hey, they had a first place schedule last year with Taylor Heineke, pretty much a backup. They managed to win seven games. If they can upgrade the quarterback position, maybe this team is ready to compete and maybe make some noise in the playoffs. And then there's the other side of the of the uh, the viewers who think that pretty much the opposite, that there's uh, there, there are a couple pieces away, they need to fill more holes. Should've Where do you stand on, the, on either side of the fence? Yeah, I wish I were smarter because then I would know the answer. Um, <laughs> but here, here, here's where I'm at. I'm, I'm always kind of an optimistic guy. The defense last year underachieved. I don't think anybody would dispute me saying that. But if you look at it on paper, they're still very good. Like, they're still loaded with playmakers and, and should be good. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I, I tend to believe the defense will progress next year instead of regressing again. I, I just think there's a lot of talent there. Uh, we saw little flashes of it. I, I don't know that I saw enough to, to lead me to be like, push my chips to the table optimistic. But I, I, this is a make or break year for the defense. They have to be way better than they were last year to justify the money, the draft picks, the resources, everything that's gone into them, including hiring a head coach who's a defensive mind. Uh, they have to be way better. I, I think they will be way better. Um, I think that's what's going to drive the improvement. I, I see them. I think it's fair to expect playoffs next year. You, know, you look around the division, you look at how nine wins probably gets you there more often than not, um, you know, in the new playoff format. I, I don't think that's an unfair thing to say coming into the season without having seen the way everything shakes out. Uh, you know, it, if they turn in a, a seven and 10 next year, I think people will be disappointed. I'll yeah. be disappointed. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of us would Michael to, to wrap this up though. I have one last question for you because there's a lot of speculation uh, amongst the fan base about the quarterback position. Let's just take the trade possibility out of the equation. If Washington were to sign a free agent quarterback, do you see Washington being in position to draft a quarterback in round one? Yes, I, I think they absolutely will if they don't land one of the big names. I think, you know, you're talking about stuff bigger than football here, too. 
new rebranding, new stadium, you know, new name, new merchandise, new uniforms. You need excitement to sell those things. And, and you know, let, let's call this what it is. Mitchell Trubisky is not excitement. You know, you're not, you're not walking through that door moving a lot of jerseys on Fanatics. Uh, but I, I think you could take even Either of the kids, if they're there, pick it or Malik Willis. Um, you know, those, those are the two you keep hearing, and obviously. If they're on the board at 11, I think that would excite people. I, I think fans would understand, hey, may, maybe we're a year away, uh, you know, from seeing these guys. But I, I, a rookie brings an amount of excitement you can't generate anywhere else, you know, aside from a major splash trade. I, I think they could, and I think they should. I think it's the most important position in sports. And, you know, if you feel good about one of those guys, Go get them. Don't worry about the draft pick. You know, go, go get them. Franchise quarterback, that's all that matters. Absolutely. Mike yeah. Horn, I think the entire fan base would agree with you, sir. I can't thank you enough for being able to take out some time for us again, <laughs> Michael. I hope you have a great night. Enjoy this beautiful weather while we still have a chance to. All right, bro? All uh, right. Y'all take care. I'll catch you down the line. All right. Catch you. All right. Thank you, ya. Michael. All right, guys. That was awesome to be able to speak with Kyle, Phillips again. Kyle, did you just call him Brett? And, uh, I didn't mean to. Uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, I, you know, I, I like caught up my. Uh, you just voice told a lot. You just, <laughs> you just called one of the biggest reporters in the bruh. area, bruh. Hey, bruh. Hi, hey, bruh. That's what, what are you twenty? Yeah, yeah, just just wait till I talk to like one, a player or a coach like I that. I know. Dude, then it'd be really weird. All right, uh, bruh. Uh, but before we get joined by our next guest here, let's talk about uh, some of these fan questions that we got submitted. And this one's from the Colonel himself. He says, personally, go. I want Malik Willis at 11 if he doesn't go before then. I don't want to move up, provided we contract the veteran first. What did you guys see from the quarterbacks of the Combine that raised or lowered your estimation of the college big names, Hall? Uh, I didn't really – Uh, well, I will say that Kenny Pickett was a lot more accurate than I, I guess that I saw um, watching him play at Pittsburgh last year, but he definitely came out. Obviously there's no, there's no rushers around. It's in shorts and t-shirts, but I mean, accuracy is still accuracy. And I definitely think that that opened my eyes a lot because he's definitely a lot more accurate than I thought he was. And as far as Malik Willis goes, I mean, he just showed off his arm. He showed off his cannon of an arm throwing the ball like 60, 70 yards, just right on the money, just dropping dimes in the bucket. So um, outside of those two, I didn't really see anything that had really kind of lowered or uh, raised my expectations other than, again, Kyle's guy, Derek, Derek, uh, Derek. Um, mm -hmm. Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter. I don't know why I wanted to say Derek. Desmond Ritter, who uh, he's a lot faster than I thought he was. So that definitely kind of opened my eyes a little bit too. Yeah, and then Kenny Pickett had a 10-foot ten, uh, ten broad jump, which is absolutely incredible. I'm really showing his explosiveness. You know, Desmond Ritter was leader there with 10-7 in a broad jump of the quarterbacks. And so I think Kenny Pickett kind of showed the athletic side of himself. I know if you watch the film, you could see him getting outside the pocket and extending the chains, you know, the stuff like that. But I was very surprised to see that he ran a 4-7-3-40, had a 33-and-a-half-inch vertical. Uh, so I thought that was very, very telling from Kenny Pickett, the athletic side of everything. We've seen what he can do on the field. Field, but what uh, in, in the film room as a pr uh, processor, but what can you do athletically? I think that was by putting numbers next to it. I think that kind of raised Kenny Pickett just a little bit because like I talked about on Monday, I thought he was kind of like a Matt Castle type. And obviously I was wrong about that because Matt Castle wasn't this athletic. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And like you said, I think uh, if you've been watching Pickett a lot, you kind of, you knew that he was a very underrated athlete. I mean, the guy, he, he's made some very good plays with it, with his legs. I will say that, but yeah, I, I think the numbers are kind of right where, like the top of the line where you would think that that would kind of improve his stock. Like if he originally it said he ran a four, six, seven, and then it got bumped down. I know cause they're having issues with the yeah. timer, but um, so that's good. That's awesome for him, for, for a player like him, I will say, and you're completely right hall with him and throwing in shorts. He looked very, very good. And I knew he was, he's, he's an accurate quarterback, but who he reminds me of, who also had sneaky athleticism was a similar size and is very accurate with the football had one of the best workouts of all time at his pro day is Sam Bradford. Mm. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's, you know, is that a good thing or no, probably not. Most would say, but uh, no, but the, the you're thing saying that Kenny really is going to be a career backup, right? But he's going to get a <laughs> lot of money for it. Well, no, uh, no, not a career backup. He just always yeah, would get started. contracts and then not. Yeah. Nobody that. knew how. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say that. that this, the combine really did kind of show what I kind of thought after the senior bowl. And that is Malik Willis is hands up the, 
guy, not necessarily just from like a tape or, or athleticism standpoint, but he just sucks all the attention out of everybody. It's like everybody's just focused on Malik Willis and everything that he does. He's talked about all the time. That's just people just can't say enough about him. And I think you're really starting to see him kind of break away from the rest of the pack. I, I will say if you the Sam Bradford comparison is actually almost spot on. And honestly, if you look back at Sam Bradford's career, he was pretty productive. He's just yeah, he was never solid. Healthy. Yeah, exactly. He's never so healthy. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's actually not a bad comp. It's yeah. not a bad comp. It's just like, like you said, he just always would get contracts and wouldn't live yeah. up to him. You know, Nobody, it was crazy. He just always get hurt. Right. And the yeah. next question from the Colonel is, provided we acquire a veteran quarterback and we keep number 11 in the draft, are there any non-quarterbacks that are must-have at 11? Oh, yeah. What do you I'm want, gonna... Hall? Oh, sorry. Uh, I got to go with Traylon Burks. I think that you put a guy like him on this offense with Terry, Logan Thomas, a weapon like Antonio Gibson. Hopefully, Curtis Samuel will be back healthy next year, and you can kind of move him like a chess piece. But you got a guy like Terry on the outside, a guy like Traylon Burks on the outside. You can work him all over the field. I definitely think he would uh, take this offense to a whole nother level. Yeah, and look, I know a lot of people will say Traylon Burks did not grade out well at the Combine, ran a 4 5 5 40, a 33-inch vertical, which is a half less than what Kenny Pickett got, for example, just to put in a comparison there, but a 10-foot broad jump as well. So it it shows the explosiveness, but like I said, it kind of reminded me of Anquan Bolden. But sitting there at 11, if Ahmad Gardner is there, that you have to pull the trigger on that guy. Didn't allow a touchdown in three seasons as a starter, uh, as a cornerback for the Bearcats. He's a really good corner, long-armed. I talked about on Twitter the other day because Rivera had a quote uh, over combine week saying, you know, you have to play to your division. You know, that's what Andy Reid taught him. You have to build your team to be able to compete against your division rivals. And given with what this division has with Devontae Smith, with um, uh, Mari Cooper's leaving now, obviously, but CD Lamb, Michael Gallup, and then Kenny Galladay in New York, you would want a long armed, strapped corner, and that's what Ahmad Gardner would bring. So that would immediately help this team in being able to face those division rivals and getting to the playoffs and just getting to the dance, baby. So for me, it's Ahmad Gardner at 11. What do you think, Reed? Yeah, um, I, I think both of those guys. I mean, I was going to go receiver and, and corner. Um, another one you can throw in there. I don't. He won't be there, but actually he might. I mean, hey, crazier things have happened, but uh, Kyle Hamilton still is a fantastic yeah. safety prospect. Um, I know great. that he, he ran out. Uh, that's what I'm, I know that he ran a lot slower than, than people yeah. show. And it's weird because like on tape, he's covered sideline to sideline like nothing. But that 40 yard dash was a little tough for him. Uh, but so I still think that you would take him if, if he ends up falling. But I, I'm going to go with wide receiver as well, but I'm going to go in a different direction. Uh, I'm going to go Garrett Wilson. I still think he's the best mm-hmm. wide receiver in this draft class. Um, Him and. Traylon Burks, I think they just they offer different things. But another person to keep an eye on, Drake London. I think Drake London, it, it, just his size would bring something that we haven't had in a while at the receiver position. But you really can't go wrong with any of those guys. Like every receiver in this class, you can get a re- wide receiver in the third round and be confident that they can come in and produce because this is such a deep wide receiver class. Yeah, and then bringing up the next question in our Discord chat server from our guy, Mr. Tony Shivers, constant contributor. Thank you, Tony. He wants to know, Reed, I'm going to stick this with you. Any under-the-radar guys that stood out at the Combine that would make you want to go back and watch film on? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's a good amount of, of players. I I mean, I've talked about him before, but Tyler Goodson, you look at him out of Iowa. He had a, he had a pretty good Combine, but um, I'll stick with uh, the wide receiver position, and this is going to be somebody that I talk about a little bit later, later and that's Khalil Shakur, the wide receiver out of Boise State. Uh, I'll touch on him later when we do the prospect breakdowns, but – He's somebody to really watch, man. He's a lot of fun to watch his game film of, and he, he ran a pretty good about what you would expect him to run uh, at the combine and it's vertical and stuff. It's nothing that you didn't see on tape. So it, it makes sense. And I'm excited for him. Yeah. For me, Tony, it's Christian Harris. I know it's kind of probably a cop-out answer given the fact he's a linebacker from Alabama. He probably project his second or third round, but the fact is that he ran a four, four, four 40 had a 34 and a half inch vertical and his broad jump was 11 which is insane, which was the highest of the linebackers. And so I kind of, I want to see those numbers and I want to go back and watch his film a little bit more. I was able to see the national championship game against Georgia. I thought he really showed himself a couple plays there, showcased his talent as an edge defender uh, from that linebacker spot. But because of his combine results, man, I definitely want to go back and watch some more film on him because he is intriguing to say the least from the linebacker spot as a prospect. What do you think, Hall? Is there anybody that stood out the combine under the radar that you want to go back and watch film on? Um, yeah, I don't, um, if you're like a big, like draft person, I'm not going to say he was under the radar guy, but if you're just a casual person that doesn't really know about like the wide receiver depth that, uh, Reed was just talking about, 
Uh, a guy that I really stood out to me that I would love to have in Washington is I want to, uh, his name Christian Watson from South Dakota yeah. State. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. From I think North that uh, he State, tested yes. very well. He ran a four three good. six forty. Yeah. Had a thirty eight and a half four. inch vertical and yeah. eleven Dominate. four broad jump. Dominated exactly. the Senior so, Bowl too. Yeah, definitely dominated the Senior Bowl. Came to the combine, just showed and proved what he pretty much what he put on tape at the Senior Bowl, and I definitely think that uh. He's, he's, he's a guy that's going to be a, a high riser in this draft come uh, come April, and I definitely think that if you can get him in the second round, early second yep. round or something like that, that would be a great addition for uh, Washington. Yep. Yeah, I would agree with you in that breath. Now, our next question is from Yam Starch in our Discord chat server. What is the number one most important step they need to make on defense to get it back to how it was two seasons ago, at least how it was in my eyes and how it felt, is what he's saying. Right. What do you yeah. think, Reed? Uh, um, I think you just got to get after the quarterback. Having these defensive ends, having a Chase Young, Montez Sweat back, um, assuming Chase Young's healthy and, and can contribute, that's just – I know that they didn't perform up to expectations early on in year two. Well, let's say that that's a sophomore slump for Chase Young. Uh, the guy's too talented. He's too physical. He's too good of a leader and a student of the game to not be successful. They get after the quarterback. They get back there with Chase Young, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Matt Ioannidis, Montez Sweat. These guys get after the quarterback. It's going. You're going to see a different William Jackson. You're going to see Kendall Fuller uh, continue to be fantastic. Cam Crow. It's going to help all these guys out. So the key to getting a good defense is rushing the passer and playing the run on the way to the quarterback, which Ron Rivera and Jack Dorio stress. Yeah, getting back to where they were two seasons ago, um, I think that obviously the competition level has a lot to do with that. But that being said, they got to stay healthy. Um, I think a lot of last season was adding pieces in here like William Jackson the third that wasn't used to it kind of seemed out of position Landon Collins at first wasn't gelling right as he's starting to pick up Chase Young gets injured then Montez Sweat and his broken jaw so I think a lot of it has to do with them staying healthy because right at, like it just seemed like an accumulation of bad timing all around for the defense they were just always seemed to be a man down in some aspects so I want them to get back to being healthy and sustainable in that aspect and I think that those numbers will come back from two seasons ago yam star how wrong am I, Hall? No, you're 100% right. You guys are both right. Now I'm pretty much just going to piggyback off what you guys said because I think what all three of us are saying pretty much go hand to hand to hand. And I'm going to go with turnovers. Um, two years ago, they were, again, it goes kind of goes with reset. They were getting to the passer. They were getting their hands up, swatting balls down, which was causing interceptions. Obviously, Chase Young had a couple forced fumbles. Uh, Montez Sweat had a couple forced fumbles. So I just think, like you said, got to stay healthy on defense. The pass rush has got to get back to what they were doing, getting after the quarterback, which in turn is going to help in the back, help out the back end guys like William Jackson and Kendall Fuller, Cam Curl, and they get more turnovers, more more opportunities for the offense. Hopefully, they add some more offensive pieces, and that's more points on the board, which more times than not equals a win. And especially if we get an offense that scores a lot more, like let's say we get a competent offense and they're putting up good amount of points each week, all of a sudden, now that makes it easier on the defense. The defense will start forcing more turnovers. Yeah, they'll probably give up some points because that's what those defenses tend to do. But I guarantee you'll see a lot more turnovers. They'll be able to feast. They won't be able to pin their ears back. It'll be a lot better. So offense will help out this defense. Look at Dallas. Look, Dallas did exactly. It's perfect exactly. Example. Yeah. And Paul Murphy, I'm sorry, brother, Um, because he has a question for us. If you were in charge of our picks on draft night, who would you select at number 11, excluding quarterbacks? And we kind of already answered that uh, with the Ahmad Gardner and everything like that, so I apologize. Um, but I want to ask this question to you. This one is brought to us by uh, Orange Crush 92 Do you all feel the same way I do, where we need to have to sign Terry McLaurin before we can have real discussions about signing, slash drafting, literally anything else? The fact that we haven't extended him is really wearing down and demoralizing me by the day, LOL. So, Hall, do you agree with them that, like, basically you have to be able to shore up and extend Terry McLaurin now before you can do anything in free agency or the draft? Um, well, I would say no, just for the simple fact that free agency, the legal tampering period starts literally in seven days. So, I mean, I would hope they would get a deal done in the next seven days, but I wouldn't really count on it. Um, look, I'm getting Terry, uh, getting a deal done with Terry, like you just heard Michael Phillips say, if you see all over Twitter with the people that cover the team, that's their one of their number one priorities this offseason is to get a deal done with Terry. So I definitely think you can still attack free agency. You can still attack the draft, how you want to attack it. And hopefully adding guys to make the team better and greater is going to make a make it more attractive for a guy like Terry. And then obviously you got to get the quarterback position sewed up too. 
Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I do think that Terry would have a lot to do with the free agents that you're trying to bring in here uh, because if they don't know if you're going to be here in the future, they might not want to come sign here to your uh, to your point, Orange Crush. But we are joined now by our second guest, celebrity of the Combine, Mr. Logan Paulson. How are you doing, brother? How was your week? No, it was good, man. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of yeah, course. Did you work out at all down there at the Combine? I was trying to get a place where I could run my 40 and like do the whole combine, but just oh, didn't, was, you, wasn't in the cards. You would have smoked Rich Eisen though. <laughs> I would have smoked Rich <laughs> Eisen for sure, <laughs> but my mom would smoke Rich Eisen. So, you know what I mean? Damn. <laughs> yeah. You hear that, Rich? <laughs> you hear that, Rich? The, now, Logan, the first question I have to ask you, you know, we, we had you on about a month ago and you thought at that time that Malik Willis was the number one quarterback in this draft class based off potential now after the combine seeing these guys throw with your own eyes how do you feel about the draft class is Malik Willis still your number one quarterback so I think uh, when we talked I think I, I don't know if I said Malik was number one but it's Kenny Pickett Malik it's kind of been that right. way the whole time and Kenny Pickett um, you know like he just seems like the safer bet but coming out of the combine I kind of think the tides are total are shifting here a little bit and what I mean really? by that is every GM that I talk to every offensive coordinator I talk to not just for the commanders but for you know team, like all my buddies around the league they were like oh you know he he interviewed a little bit better than I thought and I was like well you know I heard out of the senior bowl that he was having a hard time running the offense and his coach from Liberty or Auburn one of those coaches said you know you can't learn period which is like a huge gigantic red flag and they said oh you know they got you know this he got uh, 32 on the wonder lick and he was really dynamic in the meeting he was a different type of guy but we liked his um his vibes you know and so like watching him throw he's by far and away the most dynamic uh passer of the group and obviously everyone knows about his athleticism already so to me like all these kind of positive affirmations of his character how they felt about him coming out of the meeting you see him in, at his pressures he's a, he's got like a different type of vibe you know what i mean very kind of laid back and i think that might put some people off but i think it's for for the majority of people i spoke with seem to kind of embrace that you know mm. and then obviously i think kenny pickett did a nice job but you know when it comes to just comparing arm strength and just seeing it in person live and in living color there's really no comparison. I mean, he, you know, Malik Willis is a special guy in terms of throwing the football. So I think, I think it's kind of shifting the paradigm shifting. And I think it just depends on what team makes the decision. Like right now, if I had to say, I think um, someone's Mel Kuyper's mock draft had Washington pick and Malik at 11. And that feels pretty good to me at the moment. That okay. feels right. That feels like the direction they want to go. Obviously, if you go that way, I think you still need a bridge guy. Um, but you know, I th uh, that's kind of the vibe I got coming out of the week. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So they they told you Malik Willis wasn't able to learn anything. Like, that's what came out of the like season. in life or in the like, <laughs> sports. Because imagine that's what it, I mean, that's what like it said. That. They said he can't yeah. learn. Like, like <laughs> yeah. that was, and I heard that. Like, so my, I, you know, I talked to a whole bunch of agents, my agent in particular, and he said like it wasn't like I just was asking people. Like that was information that just came up about God. him. And so imagine if somebody was talking about you, and the first thing they said, they're like. Logan just can't learn like You're anything, like, <laughs> like damn. at all. Like, like I've tried to teach him math. He just, no, he just doesn't so get I remember it. I was talking to my agent. I was like, that can't be true. And it's like, and Steve was like, or my, my agent was like, dude, like I wouldn't make this up. And, and it wasn't like one person told me that it was like three separate people told me. And I was like, wow. damn, maybe the dude's yeah. got an issue, but obviously right. this weekend quelled any of those kind of really rude comments about yeah. <laughs> that's just a, i just couldn't imagine that like on your negatives it's just like can't learn <laughs> like, <I don't> know. <laughs> uh but like, logan i don't know if you know this you caused a bit of a stir on twitter the other day did you know that i didn't know that no yeah so some people were tweeting out that uh logan paulson just said terry mclaurin isn't good underneath dot 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 just say you don't watch the guy, bro. And I, I got tagged in it, of course, because you're my best friend. Yeah, we're so best I was friends. like, I was like, guys, I'm gonna ask Logan about this. All right, just relax. Is that because did I get tagged because the sexual innuendo, or because of we're coming about football here? No, He's football. Not I think... oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. But I was about to say, if you got some news in Terry in that regards too, spill. The <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I would say is. Um, I don't remember saying that, but you say a lot of weird stuff on the radio. So what I would say is I don't think Terry is a true number one. I don't think he's a true number one receiver. Go so, ahead. Logan, what happened? I heard I heard it on the radio, essentially, or is on TV. It's, what do you talk about when you talk to other GMs and other coaches on the league? Uh, he can do a lot of stuff around deep field and everything, but he does have a issue with underneath routes and those type of balls and working with them. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
right? Sure. And I think, and I think that, um, <laughs> so yeah, so, and I think that would, that when I would talk to, I talked to Santana about this, I talked to a whole bunch of different people around the league about this and he's not like, so when you watch uh, Devonte Adams, just as an example, right. Or Cooper cup or, you know, Justin Jefferson, any of these guys, there's like a suddenness and a fluidity, kind of like a dancing to the way they run routes, like kind of the way you'd see a basketball player cross somebody up. Right. And Terry just does not have that in his game at the moment, right? right? So obviously he's got a lot of horsepower. He's fast. He can jump high and he does well when he's running straight on posts and goes and corners. Um, but in terms of like route stems and stuff, it doesn't come natural to him, right? It's not like this thing where you watch – Wilson or the other kid from Ohio State, and you're like, man, these guys have been going to seven on seven camps since they were like four years old. You know what I'm saying? They, mm. There's just a different type of knowledge when it comes to route running. And Terry doesn't have that. He just is everything. He's running as hard as he can. There's not a lot of change in velocity when he runs. I ran my routes like that. He's lucky because he runs a four three. I ran a four eight. So like little difference in production there. But so that's all I'm saying with that. I think, right. you know, that's something that can be learned. And I think he was in a perfect world, he's your number two wide receiver. Like he, he's got a skill set that speaks to your number two, taking shots, let him run the post, let him do your dirty work over the middle of the field. But in terms of like that technical guy who can win in every single one-on-one -on -one situation has this really nice kind of uh, bag of tricks that he can bring out at different times, Euro step, crossover, slide release, all that stuff, not super prevalent in his game. And, you know, there are guys like that around Lee, like DK Metcalf is another guy like that. Right. And DK yeah. Metcalf is a great pro, you know? And so it's not a knock on Terry. I think he's a great professional. I want him on my team. I'm just saying in a perfect situation, you'd find somebody maybe in this draft class, maybe in free agency to complement that skill set and let him be a better football player. Really let right. this offense be better around him. Right. There's nothing wrong with criticizing a player. Washington fans, you guys need to relax. It's okay. <laughs> it wasn't bad. It wasn't like a mean thing that you said. Yeah, I mean, I, hopefully it wasn't mean. Like, I, I respect the shit out of Terry in his game. Yeah. I respect the way he blocks. I respect his physicality, all those things. But I think it's important to acknowledge people's limitations. Like, if you're a good coach, if you're a good talent evaluator, you want to put those guys in the best situations possible. And right now everyone says, oh, why isn't Terry catching X amount of balls a game? It's because he's in the X role. I probably think he's probably more of a Z in a perfect world. Again, on this team, X all day. But getting a guy that can complement that skill set, I think, would be really important for him and this offense's growth. Right. Kyle, well, thank you for reminding me what I said. Obviously, appreciate you, that. You well, talked I'm a lot. Remind week. you of something else that you said because when you said okay. it, it warmed my heart a little bit because I've had a QB crush on Derek Carr for two years now. Oh, I wanted, no. I wanted them to sign him or to make a trade for him Gosh. before they made the move for uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick last year. But uh, I think it was on, I can't remember what radio station it was on. You do so many. You're just a, such a such a likable guy. You're on every show. He did it on but, Instagram. Uh, it was on Instagram. All right, Instagram, same thing. Um, you said that Derek Carr would be pretty much like the perfect fit for this team and what Scott Turner wants to do in this offense. And I was just um, wanted you to explain why. And also, second question off of that, I've heard a lot of comparisons that maybe Kenny Kenny Pickett can possibly be like a Derek Carr in the league. And do you think that he would be a perfect fit? Are we a good fit for this offense and what Scott Turner likes to do? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So after watching Derek Carr, I, I did it for, um, I'm doing like a, <clears throat> excuse me, a QB evaluation show on 980. And he was one of the names I've done some stuff on Instagram. <clears throat> excuse me. The more you watch him, I think the more you like his game. He's not like magic or anything like that. He doesn't have like that Tom Brady kind of big play. Like it, when the moment's big, he's big kind of thing. But in terms of, being kind of like the perfect point guard, especially this last season. I know that hasn't been always his MO. Like if you go back to 2019, not quite the same guy, but he's really good at getting the ball where it's supposed to go. He's really good at understanding defenses, his footwork, his release, the ball velocity coming out of his hand, all super high level and would definitely make this offense much, much better. Um, I think the problem with him in, in a trade type of situation is I think we've talked about this on the show before is you're giving up a lot to get him here. And then financially, you will also be giving up a lot. Yeah. So Derek Carr, to me, you could probably get away with, I'd say, between 28 and $36 million, you know, but word on the street is he's looking for 40 plus. So obviously, in that situation, all these veterans on the roster you're going to have a hard time re-signing any of them. Um, you're giving up some draft capital to get the trade done. 
what does this roster look like in two years without first round draft capital and with all these free agents having to hit the market because you can't pay them. That to me is the crux of the, uh, of the Derek Carr issue with him. You mentioned Kenny Pickett. I actually think there is some comparison, but after watching him in a one-to-one, I think that's a little bit unfair for Derek Carr. I think when you watch Kenny Pickett, I think he's got that same type of point guard mentality, not as sharp in terms of release uh, quickness, not as sharp in terms of ball velocity, Um, obviously a younger football player. So understanding and recognition is slightly different, but in terms of the quarterbacks in this class, he's the only guy that has to do like NFL reads and full field stuff and understand coverages. So um, in that sense, I think he kind of, he kind of fits the mold of this. I'm going to use the term point guard, kind of this game manager, this guy who can distribute the ball to your playmakers at a really high level. And I think that translates really nicely to what Scott does here. And then if you look at Kenny Pickett by, uh, you know, by comparison to Derek Carr, you get him at $5, $5 million a year for the next five years. That's great value. You don't give up any first round draft capital and you can, and then all of a sudden, because he's so cheap, you can now bring in free agency, free agents in free agency to support him and, the, and build a team around him, which I, why I think that's him Malik Willis is a better option. I think Malik Willis, the problem is you need a bridge guy. I, Kenny Pickett, I'm not sure you need that same bridge guy. You also think he would be willing to undergo a handoplasty, which is a hand lengthening <laughs> surgery? <laughs> I think that whole thing is totally insane. You I know, know, like the totally agents, they, they're, they're going to like these, like I, I, mean, I talked to, I was listening to something today and they were talking about Aiden Hutchinson only having 32 inch arms. And then how he was going to go to some Make specialist to like, or to like right. stretch his arm out and like get his rotator cuff stretched. And I was like, come on, guys. Like, what if it was that easy to grow? <laughs> <laughs> you just stretch and get super get in a stretching machine. Yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, Logan, one of the positions that a lot of the fan base is looking to upgrade in this offseason is linebacker. And so the yep. combine has a bunch of linebackers available and serviceable ones as well. Were there some guys that caught your arm, uh, caught your eye that maybe you heard a little bit about that are creating some buzz around the league that you saw at the combine? Yeah, um, well, the kid from, I get them mixed up. The kid from Wyoming, Muma, uh, Chad, Chad Muma, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he, I mean, when you see him in person, he looks like Sean Lee, and so and he plays like Sean Lee, and so like he yeah. gets Sean Lee comparisons all the time. And Sean Lee was a heck of a football player. So anytime you start hearing that. I haven't gotten to a full, I've watched highlights and stuff, but I haven't gotten like a full Chad Muma vibe, uh, you know, evaluation yet. But that was the buzz around him at the combine. Okay. Sean Lee, Sean Lee, everyone makes that comparison, guys from different teams. So when you hear that, you're like, I need to go watch this guy immediately. And the crazy thing is he'll probably be available in the second or third round, which just speaks to the depth of the linebacker class this year. In terms of the top end guys, I really like the kid from Utah, but he didn't run that well. But in terms of his yeah. tape, it's high level. Um, the kid from Georgia, uh, what's his name? Nicobe Dean. Dean. Nicobe Dean, yes. Obviously very dynamic tape. Not quite the athlete that I thought he'd be on tape. Mm-hmm. And I think is and has helped. I mean, everyone just saw what Jordan Davis and that whole defensive line for Georgia did. He's covered up by that group pretty consistently. And so he can run to the football and make these dynamic plays. Obviously very cerebral guy. Uh, but the kid that really, like, just walking around the room caught my eye was the kid from Montana State. Troy um, Anderson. And I know yeah, and I know he's really Andrew raw. Kyle. He did um, he did an excellent job at the senior bowl, but seeing him in person, I remember I, I first time I was like, man, I thought the uh, I thought the defensive line was going tomorrow. And then I checked my card and it's like, oh dang, that's a linebacker. Jesus. He's big, he's he's gigantic, and like you watch his highlight tape, he's playing quarterback, he's playing yep. running yep. back, he's playing tight end, he's playing slot receiver for them. Like he's just a big athletic son of a gun. Yeah, and I made a thing on Twitter today because I've been on a thing with Troy Anderson for the past two weeks, uh, thanks to Ken Johansson who put me onto him. And I was even saying how it's safe with Troy Anderson, in my opinion, to draft him a linebacker because if he doesn't transition well at linebacker, I think he could be serviceable as a safety, especially a free safety, given his range of athleticism. What do you think? I mean, he is gigantic, dude. Like, I don't know. He would be like, a, like just like a Godzilla back there. I can't like, <laughs> he, like he, he was, was the so- fastest. He was the fastest linebacker. He ran a four four two, a thirty six inch vertical. He was so big, dude. I can't. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Like he was gigantic, and I'm like just imagining him at safety. Like doesn't compute. I would say probably defensive end just in terms of body type. But yeah, that's the kind of athlete that he is. You know what I mean? Like he's a freaky athlete. Like he looks like Tim Tebow. He looks like a fast Tim Tebow at Montana State. Like he's wow. trucking everybody. He looks like a guy that they just were like, oh, like 
And Pop Warner, like, this is the kid that's like, didn't make weight, but we're going to let him play quarterback. <laughs> yeah. like, that's what he looks like. So I got to watch him as a linebacker. But yeah, like the thing that makes me a little nervous about him in the, in the fit for Washington is you took a guy that was pretty green last year in Jamin Davis. Right. And do you have an opportunity to let him develop for a year? I think that would be awesome, especially because I think he's probably going to be around the third round, which would be great value there for him. But again, fans are going to freak out. They're going to burn the whole building down. Like it's going to be insane. But I do think in terms of guys you like, especially coming out of the senior bowl, I haven't watched Montana state stuff, but out of the senior bowl, you're like, everybody was talking about the senior bowl. Like all my, all my buddies were like, you got to check this guy. You got to check this guy out. And obviously I still got to watch the tape and it's hard, it's hard to find Montana state tape. Let me yeah. just tell you. But um, I think that would be a fantastic fit for the Washington football team. If, if, if everyone can, be patient and let him grow up a little bit. One thing I do like about him is he naturally he has the instincts of cl clogging up run lanes and setting the edge of the line of scrimmage yeah. on run plays. I think that was really telling about him. He used to play quarterback too. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. Montana state. Uh, so he's an athlete. Uh, but so two cornerbacks that I think are just, it's so interesting to see the size of cornerbacks grow. I mean, you look at Tyreek Tariq Woolen out of, oh, out of yeah. Texas, San Antonio, running a four, two, six at six, four to a five. And then sauce Gardner, of course, I think establishing himself as the number one corner in this draft. Uh, what did he run? He ran a four, four, one yeah. sauce Gardner. Yeah. yeah. What did you see out of those guys? And are there any other cornerbacks or anything that you think just really impressed you overall? Well, I mean, the whole group, uh, you know, very fast. Again, I didn't stay. I didn't stay for Sunday because everyone leaves kind of all the coaches leave and stuff. I but know, um, in terms of people, like I gave uh, my agent a call and he kind of said like the whole group, yeah. of safeties and corners just physically perform very well so obviously now that that means that they're checking all these physical metrics which is important and you got to go back and evaluate the tape right, right. Um, because some of these guys I mean we've all we've all got these guys in our minds who tested really well but aren't good football players like it just it's not a one-to-one -one. so it's about looking at a guy like who's six four and saying can he play in the NFL does he have the hips does he have all these variables and I think that's where the evaluation now has to get really tight and because no one separated themselves um, in the negative, which is always good. You love to see that coming out of the combine. Everyone kind of helped themselves. But now you got to kind of go back in and dissect it a little bit more on a more um, human level, more football specific level and see what you get out of it. Yeah. And sticking with um, the combine and Sauce Gardner's teammate, uh, it seems like a guy that maybe I guess came out of the combine and had a little bit more buzz is Kyle's guy, Desmond Ritter. What were you hearing about him after his combine workout? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously his combine workout was ridiculous. And I think the other thing that was probably more important for him was that everybody coming out of the meetings was really impressed with his demeanor. You know, I think um, he just had the, – the word I heard was like he just commanded the room. And that was consistent across – Commanded the room? Are yeah. you dropping – Commanded the room? Yeah. yeah. And then, um, <laughs> and then yeah, I got to watch his presser. And there was a guy who just like knew, like people were asking about his throwing mechanics and his inaccuracy issues. And he was like, you know, I'm not worried about that. Like I, when I overstride, that tends to happen. And he just like was obviously someone who coached him up really well. But the fact that he just was like, it was like in a briefing, you know, I just was and his voice, got this deep voice, kind of booming voice. He, everyone's just staring right at him. There's nobody walking around during his presser, uh, commanded the room in a nice way. Uh, but again, with him, it's like obviously like in terms of crushing the combine interview, physical stuff crushed it. But again, when I watch the tape, man, I get really <laughs> nervous about it because yeah. Yeah, like you see some stuff, you see some NFL caliber throws and then you'll see probably four or five, seven throws where you're like, that is bad. That is right. a bad read. That's a bad throw. That's sailing. Like what's going on here. And that offense is, is pretty, um, gimmicky is maybe the wrong word but it does insulate him from making hard decisions a lot so when he does make the hard decisions obviously you get some really dynamic stuff and obviously you get some really bad stuff and so I don't understand that the other thing that's important variable I think to consider is Alec Pierce the receiver yes from Cincinnati, Cincinnati. is a baller and yep. he's thrown to that guy the tight end at Cincinnati who got hurt in like the last game of the year was was purported to be the number one tight end coming out this year so there was a lot of weapons around him that may have inflated his production mm -hmm. Um, but again, you like, you like the, you like the physical measurables. You like how he's in the meeting. The thing with him, and it's probably the most damaging for him is his tape is not excellent. Right. And everyone I talk to say, you want to like him because everything he's doing, everything the right way, he's the true pro. He's got a kid, he's got a family, yeah. he's going to get married. Like he's, he's mature, all those things. 
But um, again, the tape is something that it, it's just like a, like keeps stabbing you in the eye. You're like, what is going on here? Like you can't, you can't like get it to balance out, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, I, and it's huge too. We should know that having a kid does make you mature. I have a kid. And well, I'm probably you're the top outlier. Three. Yeah, you're not <laughs> a good example one. of that, Reed. That's I have a hard time learning just anything. <laughs> yeah, all, right, all right, Malik. Um, now, to wrap this up, Logan, my last question for you you're a former tight end. There's a guy coming out, Greg Dolchich out of UCLA. Um, we have uh, another guy, Isaiah Likely from Coastal Carolina. What did you see from that tight end group at the combine? Just to be perfectly clear, just to be fully transparent, I train with uh, Dolchitz. I train with Woods. Oh, no I train with the kid from uh, Iowa Jelani State. Woods, so, right? Oh, Charlie uh, yeah. Kohler. Jelani. Jelani. Oh. Jelani. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I know them really well, and I, I am invested strongly. Like, I'm writing the routes for Dolchitz's pro day right now. Okay. So, like, I'm very invested in them. So, if you ask me on this podcast, my completely unbiased opinion is that <laughs> Greg Dolchitz is the number one tight end in the draft. Um, but go. I think there are statistics to support that. If you look at his GPS data, he's one of the fastest tight ends in the country, faster than a lot of wide receivers. He's got – he's a converted wide receiver. He's got a nice physicality to him. In terms of that moving F piece, he, I kind of – I get the senior bowl at least. He kind of blew the kid from Coastal Carolina out of the water mm. just because he's got the raw horsepower to support. He didn't run super well. But when you look at his game tape, again, there's a guy that stands out to you in a nice way. And then, obviously, like I know Jelani really well, and he's a guy that – um, when I was with him, just blew me away in terms of his ability to like take coaching and retain it. Like you tell him one thing one time from like a technical standpoint and he would instantly get it. He's also a giant. He's like six, seven, and he's got 35 inch arms, which are longer than a lot of tackles oh and goodness. he can run really well. So for me, those two guys in terms of just trying to get my bias out of it as much as I can are obviously outstanding football players, but I think probably the best guy in the group, if you're looking for a well-rounded piece it's probably the kid from San Diego. Um, he's just big. He's physical. Like getting off the bench press, he just looks the part. And he ran well. He catches the football well. So if you're looking for like a guy who's got some nice ability in all facets, I think he's probably a guy to keep an eye on. And then, um, you know, I mentioned Charlie Kolar. He's a guy that does a nice job in terms of uh, having a nice competitive catch radius, um, which is important at the position. A little bit raw, but I think has some ability. And then I think that that idea that it's everyone's kind of got an issue in this in this uh, space is important to understand. Like you look at the kid from Colorado State, for example, he's a good football player, but he's not super fast. He's not super big. So like, where does he fit in an NFL offense? And that's kind of what you're negotiating with this group. Like Greg, for example, not great in line. Jelani's only been playing tight end for like three years because he played quarterback before that at Oklahoma State. So obviously there's all everyone's got these kind of issues. Um, but it is a good, interesting group because they're all really good athletes and they're all big dudes. So it's kind of fun right. to watch. Them. Oh, real Go. fast. Speaking of big dudes, what is it like seeing Evan Neal in person? Dude. Okay. So this is interesting. Like when I saw him, I was like, who's that skinny guy over there? Like dude, I literally, seriously, how is he 300 yeah. pounds, dude? I went, and then I walked up to him and I was like, he's pretty big. And then I didn't even realize it was him because they don't have like name tags. They just have like a number and then position. So you, mm -hmm. if you don't have your sheet with you, you like you have no idea who anyone is. And so then I, I went back to my desk and I was like, that was Neil. And he looks like he could probably play tight end. Like that's how svelte he looked. Wow. And it's unbelievable. And you see him doing all these crazy jumping exercises and the flexibility. Yeah, dude. How do you have a vertical? Uh, what I saw him jump crazy high it was at least like five of me i'm no mathematician i don't learn very well but it was high uh i yeah. would say so that was impressive. yeah and i mean obviously again with him the tape is a little bit there's some things about his game that make you kind of think the guy from nc state's probably the better pick yeah. here at the number one oh, no. overall but again like the, him uh neil cross aquano yeah kind of in that reverse order, all really good football players. So, you know. Earlier, Logan, real quick before we let you go, you talked about the F-type tight end with Greg Dolchich and others. What did you think of Cole Turner in that same breath as the F-type kind of moving all around the formation type of tight end? Yeah, interesting uh, about him is um, I haven't watched a ton of him because he's went to Nevada and who wants to watch Nevada football? But um, <laughs> seeing him at the Senior Bowl, seeing him at the, um, seeing him at the Combine, like he runs well. He's a little stiff in the hips, like a little stiffer than I think you'd like for a true F, but he does have like kind of some natural receiving ability and he runs pretty good. So, you know, that's a guy, again, 
maybe not the best tester, but the field work stuff looked good to me. And okay. so then I go back and say, I like some of the stuff he showed in terms of how he broke down on his routes, how he was attacking the football, showed nice natural hands. Then you go back and watch his tape and kind of say, is that supported? Is that workout supported by his college film? Awesome. Logan, It's yeah. this is the best advice that we could possibly get out of anybody. I needed you for tonight, and you came through for me, brother. I can't thank Thanks, you man. enough, Logan. Yeah, I sorry, know. I was so, sorry I was so slow to text you back. That's, man, that's no, no, bad. it's fine. It's it's because of Reed. You know, it's not, it's not your fault. You know, Reed just makes everybody <laughs> was, uncomffortable. That's what I do. Yeah, I, Logan, yeah. I can't thank you enough, brother. I hope you have a great night, sir. And uh, good job on the Dolchers stuff. Make sure you make it look make him look good. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. No no pressure, look like No pressure, look like you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, brother. Right, See you on car, nice. dude. Oh, man, dude, that's so awesome to hear from Logan. What a good thing for him, dude. He's running routes for know, his right? pro day. That, that means, dude, his word carries weight, my friend. It does. But yeah, before but like, we, they're not as close as like me and him are, probably. Before we get, before no we get out of here, will be, but yeah. yeah. Before we get Let's out of here, uh, we were answering the question from OC uh, about the uh, Terry McLaurin and the fact that them having real discussions getting Terry done before free agency is pivotal for this football team in their structure, the way they're doing things. Reed, do you agree with that? Um, so like it, it, that's kind of hard. Like obviously a lot of things happen like in a perfect world. Yeah. You would want to get all this stuff figured out uh, or you would have to want, you'd want to sign Terry before you get the stuff figured out. But at the same time, like we talked about, if I'm Terry, I, I mean, I know Terry's a good dude. He didn't seem like somebody who would really worry about this, but you should probably wait a little bit just to make sure that they're going the way that he sees fit at the quarterback position. Cause that's the difference between being a pro bowler every year, possibly end up being a hall of famer. Cause the guy's so talented. Uh, I just don't, nobody should have me. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, and just being stuck in purgatory for the rest of your career. You right. know what I'm saying? Like he wants to live like that. So Terry should wait, Willie. I don't, I think Terry's a good dude. I think he wants to be here. I think that he wants to be with this new franchise as they're where they're going. So it's, it's a, uh, Tough. Yeah, I think OC, I think you're right on par with that. I'm right there with you. I have anxiety about it. And I understand what you mean by because would a quarterback that's in free agency want to come here if Terry is not in the future plans? Right. No. And I, the same thing for a draft quarterback. You're not excited if Terry is not going to be on this team after this season. So I definitely understand what you mean by getting that money solidified and getting that extension done. So now we can start looking for the future and really starting to build this football team. Because if we lose Terry on offense, there's not much there that really garners a lot of excitement. So I understand what you mean by that. And I, I'm right there with you, OC. Just drink some coffee or something, man. Hopefully this thing blows over soon and Terry gets done. Last question is from Andy Burroughs in the UK. Oi! Why? How Im how important is it that we get our D line locked in ASAP and not wait till uh so like worrying about in August September like previous seasons hall? So the D line locked in? You mean yeah. you mean with contracts? Yes. Um, because uh, the whole theory or the rumor that Deron Payne was working on a contract extension, Tim Settle yeah. leaving. Yeah. Um. I mean. It's it's important, but we're just so so deep at that position that I mean, if they did if they went into the season without a deal with Deron Payne or I mean, other than the guy that's a free agent is Tim Settle, and I'm, everyone's pretty much in agreement that Tim Settle's probably going to get paid somewhere else. So outside of Deron Payne, I mean, that's only like really the and I guess Montez Sweat uh, next year, but they already picked up his fifth year option, so he's already locked in for next year. So I don't think it's that important as of right now. Like we were just talking about, the most important guys are Terry McLaurin and probably J.D. McKissick because they pretty much are the offense as of right now. And hopefully they're going to add more pieces. But, yeah, as far as the D-line goes, I mean, it is what it is. We're so deep right there. And it's such an offensive league right now that I think that they want to get the offensive side of the ball corrected first. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. i right there with Hull, um, Andy. I don't think the D-line is that big of a need, especially given the fact that the news today said that the NFL salary cap was raised for the first time over $200 million to $208.2 million per team. First time ever, a $25 million increase in the salary cap. So that gives a lot more flexibility, especially to Washington, who is top 10 in salary cap space available heading into today. So obviously that helps them out a lot, and there's a lot of other areas that need to be looked at. But I am glad to see that the talks are moving in the right direction. I don't think there's any... Um, like you, there's like adamants and like in order to get it done immediately. I don't think there's that much that goes into it. Like there is with Terry because Terry is literally the only thing really on offense. I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but basically Terry is the offense essentially. And that's why it's more important than the D line. Cause we do have a plethora at the moment. What do you think? Reed? Yeah. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think in the coming years, the D line, it's going to be of the utmost importance this season right now. I mean, you kind of just worry about getting pain resigned and then that's it. But at the same time, if this D line doesn't end up producing over, over the span of the next couple of years where they should, then you don't want to have too much money invested in this D line. Um, but you're going to have to, to keep all these guys. So hopefully they produce and uh, they continue on, but this off season, it's not too big. Yep. And then to wrap this show up, we have our draft prospect breakdown that we're going to have today. Hall doesn't have one because he didn't have enough time today, which is fine. It's okay. But Reed, who is your prospect breakdown that you are highlighting today? So we picked mid round guys. We picked yeah. late day two uh, to day three guys i picked wide receiver khalil shakir out of boise state he uh he measured in at six foot 196 pounds ran a 44 340 34 and a half inch vertical uh for his strengths he's very versatile he, he led boise in receiving for back-to-back -back years he also had 71 rushing attempts for 414 yards which is a 5.3 average during his career and he also had four touchdowns uh 12.8 average 12.8 yards per punt return and 28 and a half on kick returns in 2021 uh, he's supposed to have one of the things I've been reading. I did this didn't show up on tape, but I marked it on here that he's supposed to have elite character. Uh, Scout even went as far as to say he's a better person than player and he's a hell of a football player. So that's wow. interesting. Uh, he seems to have a very high motor. He's just a, t a team guy. It uh, gives you 100 percent every time he always seems to run full speed. He's never really slowing down. He's got fantastic footwork on in short routes, especially underneath, like kind of the opposite of what Logan was saying about Terry. This guy's very good underneath. He's a perfect slot receiver. He didn't shy away from contact. Uh, and he made some very excited circus catches. So you know that he doesn't really lack concentration. Uh, and he does have some big playability. Um, and you just get him the ball in space and you kind of watch out for his negatives. He does kind of have shorter T-Rex arms. Uh, they're a little short compared to his size. Uh, he ran a 4-4-3, but doesn't really seem to have a second gear to really pull away from defenders, it looks like. Like, sometimes these 40s, as you know, can be kind of misleading. Uh, he definitely needs to work on intermediate to deep routes. Um, he's kind of somebody who's used best just short, get him the ball in space, or get him the ball immediately as soon as you snap it. Uh, and he, so he is lacking some physical traits as well. Um, and he seems smaller than he is on tape. Like, I was surprised that he measured in as big as he did just with his playing style. Um, mm. And he's really – he's not for every offense. Uh, I think that a smart, creative offensive coordinator will have a field day with this guy. But uh, if you just want him to be a wide receiver in Excel, it, he might struggle a little bit. And also, his contested catches, I didn't really see many of them on tape. Um, I didn't really see him pull in many. I don't know if it's because he can't separate or he just doesn't have the strong enough arms, hands, or what. But for his comparison – and I was kind of pissed when I saw the NFL draft profile did this because I was – said this the other day and then i looked at his draft profile but antoine randall l he reminds me a lot mm. of antoine randall l um and he's somebody who i think could really come in and affect the game and be one of these receivers that you see come in like a jameson crowder and all of a sudden he makes an impact and he plays very well that's a quality quality breakdown sir of yeah, Khalil shakir uh, yeah, somebody that michael haas actually brought up on this uh podcast yep. not too long ago because uh, obviously michael knows his stuff everyone knows him on mm -hmm. washington twitter uh, but the player that I broke down was Brian Asamoa, the junior middle linebacker from Oklahoma. He's six foot, 226 pounds. Last season, he had 80 tackles, one sack, two forced fumbles. And in the combine, he ran a 4.5640, a 36 and a half inch vertical, vertical, and a 10.4, a 10.4 broad jump. Uh, he's obviously him being six foot, 225. He's a smaller type of linebacker, thinner build, that makes him easier to get blocked. Uh, especially on the outside zone runs. It's easy to get him pushed away. He doesn't stop people in their tracks when he's blocking. But, man, my nickname for him is Taz. He is all over the field. He's electrifying. Sideline to sideline, very good at setting the edge. He has a natural ability of, of just bulldozing linemen to set an edge just to make sure to force the running back back inside. But he's perfect, has the build to be like a quarterback spy. A lot of the times, Oklahoma on third and longs, they would leave Brian in the middle, and if the quarterback looked like he was going to run, Brian mimicked everything he did and went and got him. Sideline to sideline, he's all over there. But as soon as you put the blocker in his face, he gets kind of slow. Things He gets pushed out of the way, and so he's at his best when he's clean. And so I'd like to compare him to Landon Collins, in a sense, at the linebacker spot. That thinner build is good against running backs, quarterback spies, uh, and then coverage ability as well. And then blitzing on top of it. The guy is lightning fast, so he can definitely get back there. But like I said, in the pros, it's going to be hard for him to close that line of scrimmage, uh, being able to keep clean, because obviously he has a tough time doing that with his size. But Brian Osamoa, if you're looking for somebody to come in and be that kind of Landon Collins type of defender that can do all multi a lot of different things, but plays fast, plays hard, and is all over the field, Brian Osamoa is your guy. I, re I really enjoyed his film. But all right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. 
We're going to have more prospects for you guys on Friday. I promise. My name is Kyle. I'm Hall. And uh, I don't learn things too good. Imagine if it said that, like, on your Christian Mingle profile or something for a negative. It was like, yeah, he's good looking. He's 6'4", but he doesn't learn. He just can't learn. He doesn't See, learn anything. Honestly, that I think Logan is 100% right about that, that there were people legitimately saying that because uh, Lamar, yeah, I don't think he's lying L- Lamar Jackson's uh, tweet about how the African-American quarterbacks are still kind of uh, go through a racial bias when going through these combine interviews and stuff like that. That would mean a lot of it because if he's hearing yeah. that uh, that uh, Malik Willis can't learn, obviously. It's kind of crazy because you do always hear that like when they're coming out. There's always the a negative connotation. Yeah. It's to every single time they come out. That's exactly it's always, well, you should have seen what he got on his wonderlick. It wasn't Cam Newton got a 12. You know, it wasn't, well, and the same thing like, with Haskins, right? They said that Haskins, uh, well, yeah, but Haskins couldn't kind retain of the playbook. Yeah, he couldn't retain yeah. the playbook. Had str- uh, Jay Gruden and they were said that. right on the head, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, whatever, dude. Yeah. But you know, I'm just Haskins can point. learn anything either. There's always I a negative think. connotation of African American quarterbacks. I understand yeah. what Lamar Jackson is saying mm-hmm. in that breath. All right, yeah. everybody. We will see you guys on Friday. Thank you so much for tuning in. And make sure you guys comment. What do you guys think about our prospect breakdowns? Is there somebody you want us to look at on Friday or in future episodes of Breakdown? Or if you just want to comment on what we talked about in this show, we'd love to hear from you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Woo!